Um, so as Dr. Cobbs mentioned, I'm going to be speaking about the high throughput drug screening we've been doing here at the Ivy Center for GBM patients and how this has led to a clinical trial that we just recently launched. <laughs> Um, so, as we've heard already this morning, why are we interested in cancer stem cells or tumor-initiating cells? And it's because it's their believed to be the cell population that's resistant to standard therapy. So GBM patients have their standard treatment. Usually they do better for a while and then the tumors grow back and it's thought that's because of its the stem cell-like cells that uh, persist within the tumor, causing the tumor to grow back. So the the real challenge here is selecting the drug or combination of drugs that's going to be most beneficial to a particular patient. And again, as we've heard today, each tumor is different. So again, it kind of highlights the point that not uh, a given drug is going to work on the entire patient population. Uh, so uh, what we've been doing at the Ivy Center was after we received funding from the Ivy Foundation was really to pursue generating uh, tumor-initiating cell lines for individual patients and patient-derived xenografts um, and really testing them uh, on a number of different drugs to kind of come up with a custom panel for brain tumors. Uh, the grant itself is currently in progress. It actually involves up to 50,000 small molecules, which are actually molecules of unknown activity. Um, and so that's currently underway, but before we actually embarked on the huge uh, 50,000 compound screen, we actually did a pilot just to establish the methodology for uh, the GBM cells. Um, and that actually involved 1,000 FDA-approved drugs. And what we were surprised uh, from our findings there is that a lot of uh, FDA-approved drugs that we would never have thought could be applicable to uh, brain tumors were actually popping up as potential candidates. So what we actually do in the lab um, is uh, when the tumor is resected, we go through a protocol um, that's used to establish uh, and select for the stem cells, essentially growing the cells in serum-free media with the uh, essential growth factors that allow the cells to kind of um, keep their stem-like uh, properties in culture. And again, this initiated as a quick um, experiment one afternoon because there was excess tissue in the lab. Um, and so we thought, why not just follow a protocol and see if we can generate stem cells. And of course, we were uh, happy to realize that we managed to grow the cells well. And that kind of one experiment, one afternoon has now ended up, we have uh, over 100 of these banked at the Ivy Center that we share uh, with, we've shared with probably about 20 um, in different institutes nationwide so far for um, their research on GBM. Uh, of course, we characterize these for stem-like properties, which involve the functional assays of self-renewal, um, expression of common stem cell markers, uh, differentiation uh, by withdrawing uh, growth factors, adding serum. We saw that they lost their stem-like properties and went on di and differentiated. And of course, um, injecting in mice, we saw that we did form tumors. Uh, so in terms of uh, the HTS uh, methodology that we're using, we basically generate a stem cell line um, as shown on the previous slide. Uh, we put the stem cells into a 384 well format. Uh, the cells get incubated with drugs of different concentrations. We then add a reagent that allows us to measure luminescence and really quantify the live versus dead cells by measuring the amount of ATP present in each well. Um, we obviously compare this to a control um, and kind of use that to determine which drugs are inhibiting uh, cell proliferation. Uh, the key thing about this technology and the reason why Dr. Foltz, when he initiated the program, was very excited about just using this kind of uh, high throughput technique was just that obviously the time frame is clinically relevant because we can screen anywhere from uh, 100 to thousands and thousands of compounds within one to two weeks. So, of course, we're not just looking at um, a drug at a given concentration. We do a dose response curve. So starting out at low concentrations of drugs and working up to a higher concentration to get a dose response curve, which we fit to a sigmoidal function to pull out an IC50 to kind of get an idea of how potent uh, the drug is against the particular cells. Uh, this is an example of what we've seen um, for patient-derived GBM uh, stem cells. Uh, example shown here, we have four patient samples that essentially 
essentially um, had similar IC50s. The black line you'll see at the top, there are normal neural stem cells which were not affected by this particular drug. And then there's a patient line there um, in blue which shows that this particular patient had no effect, uh, this drug had no effect on their um, stem cell line. So again, highlighting that not every drug will work the same for every patient. So we published our initial findings um, on the uh, FDA-approved drugs that we worked with in terms of our pilot. Um, and these drugs will uh, kind of, we ranked these drugs in terms of IC50, their potency, and also we evaluated uh, their drug-like properties, essentially based on Lipinski's rule of five, which defines what would characterize a good drug in terms of its absorption into the body, and also polar surface area, which is kind of used as a predictor of how well the drug will penetrate the blood-brain barrier. With There's uh, a theoretical cutoff there that drugs um, below 120 angstroms tend to cross the blood-brain barrier with ease compared to other drugs. Uh, if we just take a quick look there at uh, TMZ and those criteria, we can see that it fits all of those. It has zero rule of five violations and, again, a very uh, relatively low polar surface area. A lead candidate that we discovered from this initial study uh, was disulfram, uh, which is actually a drug that's commonly used in the clinic, a 500 mg uh, pill that's taken orally by patients, and it's used to treat patients with uh, an alcohol uh, problem. So it's used as a deterrent because its mechanism of action is it breaks down acetaldehyde. Obviously, if you have disulfram, you inhibit ALDH. Um, and then that, prevent, that actually prevents the breakdown in ace, of aced aldehyde. aldehyde. You get a buildup of that. If you drink alcohol, it makes you feel very sick. And so that's how it's used as a deterrent in the clinic clinically. Uh, what we saw uh, when we tested a range of these GBM-derived cell lines, that it was extremely potent and had a very low IC50 in the nanomolar range. And this was consistent uh, based on the different uh, cell lines that we de derive from GBMs of different subtypes. Um, we probed uh, the effect of metal ions because disulfram is, uh, belongs to a group of families that's known to complex metal ions. And we did see there that the uh, effect of disulfram was potentiated by copper ions. It was specific to copper. We also studied zinc. We didn't see that effect there. And we basically then further looked into the mechanism and saw that the disulfram copper complex was actually causing protosome inhibition, which induced apoptosis and killed the tumor cells. Um, over the, the time that we were studying uh, disulfram and GBM, and of course prior to that, there's been substantial literature on how disulfram has shown toxic effects against various cancer types, not just GBM. And again, a range of different mechanisms there of its potential uh, mode of action. Um, what's uh, of most interest uh, for GBM, uh, to me, uh, for this drug screening study was the fact that uh, there's evidence to suggest that uh, disulfram could inhibit or decrease multiple drug resistance, again, suggesting that it could be a great candidate to use in combination with other drugs. And also for GBM in particular, that there's evidence that it inhibits MGMT and there could also potentiate the effect of TMZ. Uh, just to highlight a couple of the papers that uh, came out around the same time as our paper, which really focused in on disulfran's mechanism of action on MGMT inhibition. And again, uh, there's a, a vast number of growing literature now that shows that disulfram actually uh, synergizes well with a lot of common antineoplastics that are used in the clinic. Um, and uh, this uh, particular study uh, was uh, quite impactful in the sense of disulfram was given to a patient. Uh, this particular patient had a melanoma that metastasized to the liver, median survival for which would be approximately seven months. This patient received uh, disulfram over a course of uh, 53 months continuously of taking the pill daily. And what was seen um, throughout this time is uh, pr approximately after three months, uh, there was a 50% reduction in actual tumor volume. And as the patient continued taking disulfram um, over the course of the next couple of years, that, that tumor growth actually stayed stable. So again, uh, that's a, uh, an example of how a drug that we wouldn't have thought could help cancer patients, but showed 
has shown some potential efficacy. Uh, if we look at uh, DTTC, which is actually the active metabolite of disulfiram, so when it's absorbed in the body, it complexes with copper and is metabolized to DTTC. And again, it is um, has no violations of the rule of five and a very low polar surface area, so we know it readily crosses the blood-brain barrier. So this work collectively on disulfiram, there's currently about uh, 10 trials, I believe, for disulfiram and cancer, but for GBM in particular, there are now currently three trials that are evaluating the effect of disulfiram on GBM patients. Uh, just very quickly, um, another surprise drug uh, that came through on our uh, high throughput screens and was uh, also studied in independent labs is mebendazole, which is an antifungal used for treating pinworms. Um, and again, we see it, it has an effect on um, certain GBM stem-like cells. And again, uh, we, there are other groups that have published uh, survival benefits in um, mouse models. So again, now there are currently three trials for GBM on mebendazole. So it will be interesting to see the effects of the outcomes of those trials. Um, currently, uh, in terms of the clinical trial we've launched here at Swedish, uh, there is one high throughput um, based clinical trial that's currently being performed for uh, AML patients, and that's at the University of Washington. But um, what's happening in this particular trial is they're basically screening a panel of drugs and using uh, the top one candidate uh, to treat that individual patient. Um, it's becoming more and more relevant that uh, combined drug therapy is more likely to be efficacious than a single agent, which has led to a lot more trials coming up. For example, this one from MD Anderson, where they've actually combined three uh, drugs with TMZ for the treatment of GBM patients. And these are, again, examples of drugs that we have um, on our panel, uh, drugs, again, that wouldn't have been thought to have treat GBM, for example, um, anti-malarial agents and an anti-diabetic agent. So that leads me to uh, briefly mention our trial, which we've launched uh, for GBM, and it's based on our personalized high throughput screening. Um, and we've it's a small 10 patient trial, um, which we've currently enrolled five patients on, and we're excited to get to uh, the treatment phase of this trial. So uh, what we're doing is we're actually taking a combination of the top three candidates that we find from our HTS assays, um, and uh, we're actually performing individual HTS for each patient using our panel of uh, approximately 76 FDA-approved drugs that we've previously found to be efficacious against GB. Uh, stem cells. So to give you an idea of uh, what this panel is composed of, it's a approximately 50% of antineoplastics that are commonly used uh, for different cancer types. And again, uh, a diverse range of other types of drugs. For example, the anti-infective class um, includes antivirals, antifungals, uh, those type of drugs. So uh, the actual clinical design is uh, shown here. So phase zero is essentially we have, uh, we're going to enroll 10 patients. They come in with primary GBM. Uh, after surgery is performed, the uh, tumor specimen goes back to the lab and is processed, as I previously uh, showed, where we isolate the cancer stem cells. Um, and then uh, we are actually going to perform RNA-seq on uh, the uh, initial tumor tissue and also the cell line that we generate. Uh, the cells are then tested against our custom panel. We perform the, uh, we will perform a drug-drug interaction analysis, which will basically, uh, once we have a rank of the top uh, drug candidates, uh, we will look at their individual interactions to make sure there are no toxic side effects. Uh, once these candidates have been approved by um, our data safety monitoring board, a team of physicians, oncologists, and pharmacists, uh, patients will um, initiate treatment using that three-drug cocktail um, at tumor recurrence. Um, and so uh, just to end with, to kind of give an overview of where we hope to go with this is um, obviously uh, we're at the stage now where we can perform uh, the HTS on a personalized level, uh, come up with a couple of drug candidates that we think might be efficacious on a particular patient. We will perform uh, the RNA-seq so that we have gene expression data on these patients that will uh, receive treatment as part of our trial. Um, and then moving forward, we, we really want to complement uh, what we're doing here at the bench level and use the system's bio 
biology approach to really look at um, the key genes and networks that are driving uh, disease progression in individual patients. Um, and uh, obviously, the overall goal is to combine all of this so we get to a point where we can uh, predict uh, drug targets um, and predict uh, what would be a good drug combination for a given patient, and in particular for recurrent patients, being able to predict a drug combination prior to tumor recurrence. Um, so uh, just a, a thank you to all my colleagues at the Ivy Center, um, and uh, I think that will set the stage for our next speaker, Dr. Balaghar, to talk about the systems biology approach to drug, drug targets for GBM. Thank <laughs> you.